Good evening, everyone. Thank you for making time to come to Nunez Community College this evening um, to participate in our history lecture series. I'm Dr. Tina Tinney, serving as chancellor here for Nunez Community College. And I appreciate everyone coming from the community to participate in something that has really come to be such a treasure for Nunez. I would like to thank Michelle Miner for her dedication and commitment to making this a very special event for our community. Um, I also am thankful for our speaker tonight, uh, Mr. Derek Ewart, who Ms. Miner will introduce in just a minute, who will be sharing um, his research on President Lincoln, who you all know is a man regarded as one of our um, American heroes, someone who was, came from very humble beginnings um, to achieve the highest office in our land. And in terms of these history lecture series, they are very special because in terms of the trials and tribula tribulations that we see in society today, it's very important that when we envision the future, we learn from the past. This is a man in our history who certainly acknowledged the divisions and the disappointments of, of the times and challenged us um, through his moral speeches and envisioned a country that was unified through his speeches that reiterated terms of we and all. So I am anxious to hear um, our speaker's um, presentation this evening. And without further ado, I will introduce Ms. Michelle Miner. Thank you, Dr. Tinney. Welcome all. Um, this is the April edition of our 2017-2018 history lecture season. I'm so glad to see you all here. Thanks for coming. Um, I'll reiterate what Dr. Tinney said. It's because of you that we are still here and we keep going and doing this. So I enjoy seeing so many of you here. Um, I'm going to further a little bit up what Dr. Tinney said about President Lincoln um, and go a little bit further by saying you know, sometimes what history teaches us is not what really happened. Sometimes when we look back, we get a clearer picture of the things that are there. And I think tonight we're going to get a little bit of a picture of some things that we were portrayed to us in these days that may not have been what really happened back then. Um, we'll get a taste of that. Know that Mr. Derek Ewart has been investigating this topic for about a year and a half, I think. He's, <laughs> it's been a long time. Um, he got interested in this. He is originally from Scotland, met his wife Myra um, on a cruise, and he's been living in New Orleans since 2013. And he came, became kind of an aficionado on Lincoln because, being, uh, because of being fascinated by what he was learning. So without much further ado, I'm going to bring Mr. Ewart up and let him tell you about President Lincoln, OK? Hopefully you can all understand me, coming from Scotland. There's a slight accent. <laughs> so I just really want to thank Michelle and everyone at Nunez for actually allowing me to do this. And this, a year ago, just over a year ago, this wasn't even something that was in my mind. Um, I guess I just started to watch history, things on, on TV, and what actually got me involved in Lincoln was a PBS show called History Detectives. And there was a particular uh, hour-long episode. And what that actually did, it, it gave me some questions about Lincoln. And I basically had to say, well, this isn't the Lincoln that I think I've been told about, so I need to learn more. And I did learn more. And as you'll see from the big bibliography that I left out there, it was like 46 books, never mind everything that I went on face, not Facebook, but the, the internet, all kinds of things. So hopefully this will be as much of a shock, well, maybe not as much of a shock, but it certainly surprised Michelle when I told her about it and gave her some of the details. So 
I'm going to cover just these topics. Now, I won't be able to answer all your questions because I'm an accidental historian, is the way I'll say it. Came across it, I don't know all the answers, but I'll try and give the ones that I do know. But as we look here, the SS Sultana, that was the PBS show that actually got me involved, so I need to explain to you about that and what made me have to think about Lincoln. We're also going to look at secession, one of the big topics in regards to the war of the time. Fort Sumter, the revenue and tariffs, and how Lincoln used his powers, or in some cases, I would say, abused powers, which can always happen with uh, heads of government. Uh, we also have the slavery and emancipation issue, which I'm sure everybody's going to be interested about. And I'm going to have a little comparison at the end. So, straight off, the SS Sultana. It was actually one of the US's worst maritime disasters. So I'm not sure if anybody's actually heard of it. But um, 1865, it was April 27th, I believe. And what happened, the SS Sultana, on its way uh, north from Vicksburg, Mississippi. It actually exploded. Uh, the boiler exploded. Over 1,800 people died. Um, unfortunately, that was actually more than you would get from the Titanic. And as you can see, this picture here actually shows that's the last picture of the SS Sultana. There were actually over 2,400 people on board. And some of them were actually the family of Union prisoner of war. Um, they were all going home after the war just ended, unfortunately, um, this massive disaster. Um, but what we have to say, why is Lincoln involved? The reason is protecting a man called Reuben Hatch. Um, now, Reuben Hatch, he was the actual the quartermaster of Vicksburg, Mississippi, and at the time, he, there was a, basically it was a special thing that was going on to return the troops uh, home and they were given $10 a head for officers and another $5 a head for the regular enlisted men. So Reuben Hatch saw the opportunity, made a little agreement with one of the steamboat captains. So they put 2,400 men or 2,400 people on this boat, which only had a capacity, a maximum occupancy of 376. So, more than eight times the amount. It was so overladen, they, had, they actually had to put um, planks to hold up the, the top deck because it was bowing so badly. Um, but in that meantime, it took three days, actually three days, to, to load up this boat. And in the meantime, two other steamboats came along, docked at Vicksburg, and left empty. So, it was a big deal um, to try and get as much money from that as he could. So who was Ribbon Hatch? It's actually the man in the center. Uh, and you'll see the people on all around him. We have Montgomery Miggs, who was the quartermaster general at the time through the war. We have Colonel Henry Halleck. We have a Major Lee, who was due to be the judge in a court martial of Ribbon Hatch back in 1862. The letter you'll see is on the right hand side. You wouldn't be able to read it, but I wanted to be able to see it. Um, so we also have General Grant, who at the time was, they were all for this court martial of Reuben Hatch back in 1862, three years before this actually happens, the disaster. Grant is actually so aware of what's going on, he actually wants to delay the court martial because they believe there is more evidence. Um, now, the reason he was being court martialed Back then, he was an assistant quartermaster um, working in Ohio. His job was to purchase lumber for the Union Army. But what he was doing was basically giving the lumber companies one receipt and giving the Union Army another one and pocketing all the rest. And that actually came to around, in those days, $450,000 he had siphoned. Um, he knew what was happening, they, they were getting on to him, so what he decided to do was throw his ledger in the river, which was such a good idea that unfortunately it washed up a couple of days later and they had all the incriminating evidence they needed. So that didn't quite work too well for him. So the court martial began. However, the man in the top in the center, 
is Ozias Hatch, which actually is Reuben Hatch's brother, who was at the time the Secretary of State for Illinois. He, in addition with the Governor of the state, Richard Yates, and Jesse Dubois, if I say it right, remember I'm not Southern, um, hopefully it's Dubois, um, if it's not, forgive me, um, he was the, also the state auditor. They all got together and basically contacted Lincoln because it was Ayas Hatch was very, very influential in helping Lincoln get elected. Ran a lot of campaigns, got a lot of funds, um, so very, very influential. And as such, you know, a few favours had to be given here and there. So in the letter that Lincoln then sends to the court martial, he lets the judge know. Oh, we missed that bit. Well, I'll need to put it back. So he actually says, if it comes up, I also personally know Captain R. B. Hatch, and never before heard anything against his character. So we have him basically granting his first maybe not his first, but certainly a big political favour, which after that, he basically then selects a, a commission of three civilians. It moves from a court martial, a military court martial, to a civilian commission. One of the three men that Lincoln suggests was actually a former law partner of Lincoln. And strangely enough, Reuben Hatch is acquitted of all charges and rejoins the military. But as we go on, later on in the, in the war, Reuben Hatch is actually, he goes AWOL. And a short time later decides, mm, I want to go back into the military. So once again, we now have Isaiah Hatch getting involved with Lincoln and also now um, Secretary of War Stanton and General Grant, who is now siding with Lincoln, they all pretty much tell Montgomery Meeks, the Quartermaster General, that they would like him back. And unfortunately for Meeks, he has to relent, allows him back in. Very shortly, he then gets made from a Quartermaster to a Colonel, and then in early 1865, wants to be, well, he's actually a Lieutenant Colonel. In early 1865, he wants to become a full Colonel, so the strings are pulled once again. And he gets made a full colonel. And two months later, he is basically in Vicksburg, Mississippi, loading up the SS Sultana. So Reuben Hatch was a man who was very corrupt. As you could see, he would do anything for money. They even had an examining board while he was getting made colonel, which actually said that he was judged not mentally fit to even hold the post of assistant quartermaster. So this is what got me interested, and it certainly wasn't what I expected to hear about Abraham Lincoln. So I thought, I need to learn more, and I did. So we can look just at the election. You'll see the red and pink going between those colors. Um, the legend may not be great for you to be able to see, but the reds and pinks, those are where Lincoln won votes um, for that 1860 election. Um, so you can see generally it was mainly the north, a little bit of the west, not much midwest. Um, but definitely he had no electoral votes won in the southern states at all. And of course when he came in, everything was about secession. At that point, he'd already seen seven states um, secede, one of them being Louisiana back in uh, January that year. So, yeah, had a few problems to try and deal with. So, what were the press saying about it? I don't know if you can see all that. Is it coming out okay? No, blurry, okay. Well, hmm. So, basically, um, we have 10, we have 10 uh, snippets from newspapers that range from December uh, 1863 to March 1861. Um, now, for me, having to look at it. Basically, there's one that says, New York Times, we were divided and confused till our pockets were touched. Um, we also have the South. The South has furnished near three-fourths of the entire economy of the country. Um, now, in all of these, unfortunately, you know, I guess it's been a bit blurry, but they all mention revenue and economy. So in this entire time, 
Now, this is all the Northern press. All they're doing is talking about the economy, how much money they're going to lose if the Southern states actually leave and they don't get them back in. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know if you see anything missing from the headlines then that I'm talking about. Um, his, we'll go into his view on secession. So obviously, we had to have some kind of views. And obviously, this is all blurry, I'm guessing. Yeah. So I'm not sure if it can be adjusted by someone, maybe. I don't know. But basically, 1848, um, he basically says that any people anywhere being inclined and having the power, they have the right to shake off existing government. Um, he viewed that as a very sacred right. And he even says in it that it doesn't need to be the entire people. It can be... It can be a minority of people that can actually shake off, basically, the shackles of government. In effect, 1848, he is saying, if you don't like what's, what's going on, you have the right to be able to leave. But come 1861, in his inauguration, he basically states that no state can leave the Union, and the only way you can do things is either exercise the constitutional right to amend the government or to overthrow the government. So basically what that meant was, you know, you can, you can change the government, but you just can't leave it. Um, so 13 years, as a lawyer, you know, thought he might have known that bit. So we're actually looking at the secession of West Virginia. I was hoping it would be a little bit more funny, because we know Ron's here and I'm trying to do as good as I can when we're on. So. Um, West Virginia. So what happened there? We had some states, uh, counties within the state on the western side. They decided they didn't want to be part of Virginia. So they put a petition to the statehood, which is on the left-hand side. Um, now how that happened was basically they claimed that on the western part of Virginia that they were the restored government of Virginia. So as such, that gave them the legal right to basically you know, petition for being removed from the state of Virginia and forming their own state. Um, so Lincoln gave the authority to do it. He even said that um, basically, if the South can do it, we can do it, but we are doing it for the right reason. We are doing it for the Union. Um, but the actual Constitution, Article 4, Section 3 of the Constitution, it does actually require the entire state legislators to actually vote and allow any state to be changed or formed. So obviously the regular government at the time within Virginia hadn't done that. It was a small section of state, a small section of the state. Some counties decided, yeah, we, we want to break away. And going by what the constitution says, it doesn't really look like they even actually had the the basically authority to do that. But Lincoln nonetheless says, yep, why not? Um, so, going about actually the legality of secession in itself, so when these southern states were deciding to secede, they all felt they had the right to do it. Lincoln now felt differently. Thirteen years previously, he would have agreed with them. But as president, what do you do? You want to keep everyone, so I guess you change the, you change the rules. So the Declaration of Independence um, from 1776 is on the left. You'll see um, on the top right, that's the Articles of Confederation. That was uh, two years later. And at the bottom, that's the, from the Paris Treaty which of 1783 after the Revolutionary War. Even the King of Britain acknowledged, as you'll see in all of these, that they all acknowledge that the states themselves are all free, independent, and sovereign. So we have quite a lot within the Constitution basically saying that yeah, they're free, they're independent, they can do what they want. Um, but I guess as a lawyer, you would have thought maybe Lincoln might have read these documents. But maybe not for that. So, even in the Gettysburg Address, so um, he does actually mention indirectly the Declaration of Independence. But obviously that also states that you have the right to secede. You have, you have the right to be free and independent and sovereign. 
So it seems quite ironic that he uses that same term in the Gettysburg Address. Um, it does say that they're engaged in a civil war, t testing the nation. So I guess to me, that's a bit of a hefty test because the revised figures show about 750,000 men or soldiers died in, in that war. And I think they said it was maybe about another 400,000 um, to deal with civilians and others afterwards. Um, obviously, I don't know the exact figures, but... Um, so obviously, he's re resolving that the dead shall not have died in vain and the government will not perish. Well, I guess to me, showing that if like, secession was legal, it seemed a lot of people did die in vain. And that the bit that almost got me as well is the government will not perish. Well, these states were seceding, and to me, the union was still going to be there. It was a smaller union, but it was still there. Um, so I guess, you know, to me, mm, it's not maybe the right phrase for me. Um, but the strange thing is, and I'm not sure how many people know this, that after the war, it took up to three years for some states in the South to actually be, as they would say, readmitted into the Union. So it seems a bit strange that um, you know, if Lincoln has said to everybody that these were rebellious states and they didn't have the legal right to leave the Union, then they should still be in the Union. However, they weren't allowed to be readmitted until they voted the right way for certain amendments. Um, and once they voted that way, they were allowed back in to rejoin the Union. So basically, Congress ruled at the time, obviously after Lincoln had died, that they felt that states obviously must have had seceded. It's just unfortunate that they didn't agree with Lincoln, or they, well, they agreed with Lincoln at the time and didn't disagree with him until after he died. So Fort Sumter, um, you'll see on the top, it's the picture that everybody imagines of the attack of Fort Sumter that lasted 36 hours, um, which, in case you didn't know, it suffered no casualties. In fact, the only two people, two people did die, and they were Union officers, and they, it was actually, they were given a 100-gun salute before they surrendered the fort, and unfortunately at number 47, a cannon backfired and killed the two Union officers. And after that, they quite promptly stopped it at 50. Um, I guess if they went another 100, they may have killed another two. Um, but as you see on the bottom, this is what Fort Sumter looked like after the Confederates came in and took over. So kind of going completely against the whole image of of what you would see up there, the flames going over and destroyed and wanting destruction. So where was Fort Sumter? Right smack bang in the middle of the harbour. Um, now, one of, the, one of the things that I think, and the opinions being that, well, Fort Sumter was actually being built at the time and it was being built as a customs house. And one of the reasons we feel, I feel, that, uh, that there were no casualties is because Fort Sumter, it was in the middle of the bay, not to be attacked from shore or to attack the shore, but the idea was being any ship coming into the harbour that was not prepared to pay the customs on the freight they were bringing in could be attacked from all angles and would quickly sink to the, the bottom. Um, so that's my opinion on why I think there were definitely no casualties. And after 36 hours, you would have thought somebody might have got one good shot in. Um, <laughs> Yeah. But was this actually the first skirmish? So you will not be able to see this, but unfortunately with the slightly blurry um, part on there. But this was actually a list, if you could have seen it. Um, it shows all the captures and surrenders prior to the attack on Fort Sumter. Now, South Carolina, they had... They surrendered several areas. Um, in fact, Major Anderson, who we know of Fort Sumter, he actually abandoned a fort to move to Fort Sumter. They moved their, they moved their troops into Fort Sumter, the Union. So it was like, hmm, you know, we're going, we're going to put this here, even though this place isn't, hasn't even been built yet. So obviously they were wanting to try and make sure that it was a little bit harder to attack. Um, but 
there was also the Star of the West, and I don't know if anybody knows about it, but the Star of the West was, there was a, an earlier union attempt to actually reinforce Fort Sumter. And that happened in January 9th, I believe, um, it's the exact date. And what happened was they were fired upon, the, the ship was hit three times, they abandoned the attempt and returned home to New York. Um, so basically, a Union vessel had already been fired upon three months previously. We have all these, ah. So, I, I, I have to thank Ron for that one, I think. So thank you, Ron. Oh, oh, we need it back a little bit more. Well, well, anyway, for the short seconds that you saw something there, um, you, can, you can actually tell that there's, there's been quite a lot of things happening before Fort Sumter. So in, in some ways, you could almost say no harm, no foul. You know, nobody's, been, nobody's really had any serious things going on there. They've surrendered forts. They've moved. They've, they, you know, the Union have left. Um, but obviously, they deem that Fort Sumter, you know, that's the one that starts it all. Um, so that's hmm, an unfortunate thing. But as you can see, it really doesn't give a reason as to why they had to attack Fort Sumter. Um, but in Lincoln's cabinet, um, what were they talking about at the time? Well, basically, they were saying, uh, we've got Caleb Smith, the Secretary of the Interior at the time, Edward Bates, the Attorney General, we've got Simon Cameron, State of, uh, the Secretary of War at the time. They all felt Sumter couldn't, couldn't be maintained, you know, they couldn't do anything about it. They thought potential casualties um, if they started or a war could begin. Um, even Montgomery Miggs, the Qu Quartermaster General, he says something that's, that'll go into, that makes it maybe a bit more sense. When he says he ordered us to see General Scott, tell him instructions of the president, he wished this thing done and not to fail. And the reason I've got this saying, what about Gideon Wells, Secretary of the Navy? He had a, wrote a quite, quite a big diary, um, and he was Secretary of the Navy for the entire war. But contained within this, there were several points that, that he had. Um, I'm really not wanting everybody to try and read everything, but you know, I, I feel it's like some things you just need to see. But basically, um, in his diary leading up to the war, he was basically everyone. Everyone was against reinforcing Fort Sumter except Lincoln. Lincoln was basically wanting to play a little bit of chicken. Was only going to flinch at the last second, um, according to him. Uh, he, I also discovered that. Um, oh. Yeah, yeah, we can keep it at that. I think, no, back, back, yeah. If anybody's got different vision with their glasses, just move about the seats then, please, until you, until you get it right. Um, so anyway, moving on, um, it did show that he acknowledges that the rebel commissioners had been in contact with the government at the time, showing that they had a truce in place as long as, you know, they would not reinforce Fort Sumter and, you know, without giving basically notice to uh, the governor of South Carolina at the time. Um, and obviously, when it came to the, this reinforcement in April 1861, they didn't really tell them. But you will see as well, and this is the bit where it gets a bit interesting for me, it was that um, Gideon Wells was finding conflicting orders. He was being given orders to basically reinforce Fort Sumter, but he was finding other orders to reinforce Fort Pickens in Pensacola. Um, so if you look into it, it, the more it tells you about Gideon Wells was that they didn't really trust him because to him he was a Democrat, it was a Republican government, and they didn't trust that you know, he wouldn't give information out that was crucial. So it seems as if they were almost giving him one thing, trying to keep something else hidden. Um, so when he approaches Lincoln with it, Lincoln tells him, give it no more consideration, don't even think about it, imagine it never even happened. Um, so we have one set of ships going, he's getting orders to go to Fort Sumter, and there's another order of these ships going to Fort Pickens in Pensacola. Obviously the ships can't be in the same place at the same time. 
Um, and as you'll see, there's a bit here that says there was a Lieutenant Porter. He was actually on the Pensacola mission, but there was no record of him actually being on that mission for all intents and purposes, according to Gideon Wells reports. He was going to Fort Sumter. So the way I see it is, if, if you were to read between the lines, it was a case of trying to let the South um, believe that they were going to reinforce Fort Sumter, but the entire time they're heading down to Pensacola. So it was really just almost an encouragement to see if the South would kind of bite. Um, and also the, the bit at the very end that, um, that I find the most interesting is he was given telegrams from, a, um, he was shown them from an actual telegraph operator and they'd came from a newspaper correspondent and what he'd done, he'd basically sent these telegrams to the South, this correspondent, letting them know basically about the attack on Fort Sumter. So the South has advance warning, Fort Sumter will be attacked. They decide to try and, or Fort Sumter will be reinforced. They decide, okay, we have to do it before they can reinforce them. But the correspondent, you would think after giving away official secrets, you would think maybe he'd be jailed. But no, what actually happens is shortly after that, he's appointed the Minister of Lisbon for the federal government. So, seems a little bit strange. So, even um, Gustavus Fox, he was one of the people that would be responsible for this mission to basically uh, reinforce Fort Sumter. He wrote a letter to Lincoln, giving his apologies over what had happened. But in the letter Lincoln wrote back, May 1861, as you'll see from this, you know, the cause of the country would be advanced by making the attempt to provision Fort Sumter. So Lincoln was clearly happy that Fort Sumter had not been reinforced and everything that happened afterwards, he seemed to be perfectly happy with. Um, so telling Gustavus Fox, don't worry about it, everything happened the way we wanted. Of course, um, you may not know this, but South Carolina in 1852 had a convention which gave it an ordinance which actually gave them the right to secede. They actually put that in as basically a, a side part to their constitution. So I guess, once again, as a lawyer, Lincoln didn't see that. Um, I guess he wasn't getting paid $200 an hour, so he didn't need to do too much work. Yeah, never know how many people have used a lawyer. Yeah. Um, so the revenue and tariffs. This is just, this was a picture at the time, a cartoon done, um, and basically it was just shown when the South was seceding, the states were leaving, it showed a picture of what, what the South were doing. They were basically, they were taking their money with them. Um, and we had uh, President Buchanan at the time, being the old worried women, wondering what they're going to do to get their money. Um, so it was generally regarded that the South basically paid the lion's share of the government revenue. Um, and if you just have just a few little looks at what uh, Lincoln's thoughts were on tariffs, on government revenue, it does seem that he was kind of for them. And, you know, he would have liked to have taxed people quite a lot, I think. Um, so you'll see, that even at the first one, in favour of a high protective tariff. Um, you know, and at the bottom one, when he's talking to General Baldwin, his General Baldwin was from Virginia, and they were discussing about what they could do to keep Virginia in the Union to ensure they wouldn't secede. And General Baldwin actually told Lincoln, just let them be, in time they'll realise what they've done and they'll come back. And Lincoln said, what am I to do in the meantime? What would become of my tariffs? Um, so. And once again, you know, there's a certain issue that so far no one's been talking about. Um, but we'll come on to that later. Um, so his use of powers. Um, he, quite early on, um, right after the, the, the attack on Fort Sumter, he does actually you know, call for a, you know, 75,000 people for, uh, for, the, for the militia from across the states. Um, 
Now, in that, um, there were actually several state governors who refused that, and strangely enough, um, they were never punished. So you would think disobeying the president and a, what would be a legal order, you would receive some punishment. That didn't happen. So when he was calling for the militia, he actually used, stated the 1795 Militia Act, but that only gave him powers to basically um, to repel invasion. And I'm sure as everyone knows, the South certainly hadn't invaded anyone at that point. Um, the next one about blockading southern ports, well, this was the kind of confusing one. Um, because under the law of nations, you could only blockade a, the ports of a belligerent nation, meaning an enemy. So under these law of nations that Lincoln actually claimed he could use, that would mean that if he blockaded the ports, that would, in effect, breach international law because he couldn't do it. But in the other way, if he was legally able to do it, it would mean the South was actually a belligerent nation and as such would have been recognized as their own independent nation. Um, but also, um, a very interesting part was going on with all this that was happening, it's something called the prize cases. Um, now, what that involved was there was a Confederate ship called the Savannah um, and that had been seized by the Union, and the crew were being tried as pirates. Um, so, the actual jury came back with a hung verdict. Um, they, they couldn't make a decision on it. Uh, a juror actually asked the judge at the time to determine if there was a civil war in existence at the time. The judge refused to do it. Um, obviously, legally, politically, not good for his career. But um, for the, the reason being that he couldn't give any guidance or refused to give guidance was that if these men were found guilty of being pirates, um, as I said, that would have broken international, that would have broken international law. Um, and if innocent, they would have been classed as prisoners of war. And the Confederacy would then be recognized as a nation because they have prisoners from another nation. So it all came back hung, they all went their way, they didn't rule on this anymore. Um, and also you'll see that Lincoln actually appropriated public funds of $2 million at the time. Um, didn't tell anyone until uh, one year later in Congress that he'd actually done this. He'd sent out three civilians to actually purchase ships, um, all kinds of goods. But it's actually, if you look into the Constitution, um, it's really only Congress that has the power to, if you look at it, it was um, actual Article 1, Section 8, where Congress has the power to declare war, raise and support an army, and provide for organizing a militia. So, for myself, he's kind of overstepped his mark. Um, but another interesting thing that I just found out recently was in a letter to a William Herndon, which was actually... Um, a former law, part of Link, uh, law partner of Lincoln. Um, and in this, you know, he was giving Herndon his view after he'd voted a particular way. Um, this was in 1848. And basically, one of the things Lincoln says in this letter is that our convention understood to be the most oppressive of all kingly oppressions. Uh, and it said that no one man should hold the power of bringing this oppression upon us. So what he was talking about was earlier on, he said, allow the president to invade a neighboring nation whenever he shall deem it necessary to repel an invasion and you allow him to do so whenever he may choose to say he deems it necessary for each purpose and you allow him to make war at pleasure. Lincoln, 1848, was very much in line with the Constitution. Um, and... I can, I can see Michelle's moving a bit more forward, so I need to hurry. Um, but obviously, he changes his mind, obviously, once he becomes president. So, um, now, another one where he basically interfered with state legislators. Now, in this, he sent actually a, you know, a letter to, it was Lieutenant General Scott, and this was in regards to Maryland, because Maryland was in the middle of deciding about secession. They'd already voted to stay in the Union earlier on, but now they were deciding to look at it again because Union troops were coming through the state. So 
what, they, what the Maryland legislators were doing, they decided to hold a special um, session in Frederick um, back in August, September of that year, of 1861. So in this, um, basically a command of Lincoln, he's basically saying that if it looks as if they're going to do treasonable actions, arrest them. Um, and also he does allow General, uh, Lieutenant General Scott to bombard, um, in the, the last two lines, if necessary, to the bombardment of their cities in the extremist ne uh, necessity and the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. So he's basically saying, if they're going to vote the wrong way, then you know what to do. Um, and actually, when the legislators met in Frederick that year, there was at least 13 arrested and basically taken away without charge. And strangely enough, some pro-union um, representatives were put in their place and they voted to remain in the union. Um, now, one of the main reasons they needed Maryland in the union was because Virginia had already seceded. And if Maryland were to secede as well, then Washington, D.C. would be completely surrounded by the Confederacy. Um, so it was crucial for them not to let Maryland go. Oh, sorry, I missed that a little bit there. So if I put this up, there was a British newspaper at the time, the, the, the Saturday Review actually said at the time, oh, it went away, it was a coup d'etat. Basically, that's how they viewed what Lincoln was doing, it was a coup d'etat. Um, so moving on, habeas corpus, you know, by the definition, you know, it's basically, you, you know, if you're arrested, you should, you should be given a reason as to why you've been charged, why you've been arrested, um, and the right to a defence. Um, so what did Lincoln do? He suspended it and allowed detention without charge, which brings us on to um, Fort Lafayette, um, which was called the American Bastille. This was one of many forts that Lincoln actually used um, to hold political prisoners, uh, of which there were at least, I believe, about 13,500 um, throughout the time, probably many more, but at least ones that I've read of. Um, so who were the prisoners at the time? This, uh, so by September 1861, he had editors, mayors, congressmen, police commissioners, city council members, you know, foreign citizens as well who were also there. Um, this is just a small portion of a list of people who were in Fort Lafayette at the time. Um, there are some from New Orleans um, who were actually um, still in the army at the time. Um, they were in the US Marine Corps, they were in the Navy. But anybody Southern who was still in the army, Lincoln kind of felt, well, you know, we don't want to take the risk, so we're just going to put you in there. Um, so these people went in without charge, and then, especially if they were politicians, they were usually later released right after the election they were meant to be running in. Yeah. Seriously, there's, there's, a, there's a lot on it. Um, uh, so, you may not know it, but there's a large amount of foreigners within the Union Army, tw uh, roughly 25%. So, those ones were mainly from Eastern Europe, so Hungarian, Russian, Ukrainian, uh, Austrian, who had been involved in a lot of revolutions within Europe themselves and had failed. Um, so they thought, why not come to America? They've got a war. Um, he also oversaw a Union Army. Uh, they really did face no consequences. They were looting, raping, there was all kinds of destruction. Um, they also silenced critics using the army. He had to enforce the draft that they put in place um, using the army too. And they also used the troops to protect polling stations um, and ordered, them, ordered the generals to return the troops home to vote um, for, in a particular fashion. Now, to the, to the foreign um, officers, we have um, Alban Francesco uh, Schoep, hopefully I've said that right. Now, um, he was actually in command of Fort Delaware, which, if you don't know, was one of the worst Union prison camps. Um, some of his methods were basically um, putting prisoners in thumbscrews and leaving them there until the thumbs detached from their hands. Um, so it was pretty brutal. Um, however, after the war, you know, Shop, um, you would think maybe like um, Colonel Wurz of the Confederacy with Andersonville, he was, he was basically hung under war crimes. Um, 
But no, uh, Shof actually went back to working for the government in the patent office. So, you know, that was okay for him. John Basil Turchin, otherwise known as Ivan Vasilovich Turchin. So if anybody has Russian ancestry, I'm really sorry about how I pronounced that. Um, he was responsible for basically the sacking of Athens. Um, he said uh, when they were in Athens with, with his troops, I closed my eyes for two hours and Athens was pretty much destroyed. Um, his commanding officer, um, Buell, actually, he, uh, he demanded or wanted this man to be court-martialed and the court-martial was in progress. Um, However, Lincoln, in the midst of all this, approved the um, Turchin's promotion to Brigadier General in the midst of a court-martial. So the court-martial went no further, and his commanding officer, General Buell, was in fact later relieved of command. So I guess I just feel, you know, he was a micromanager, as everybody seems to know about you know, with the, the army, and I think he may have known the things that were going on. Um, and just a few more things, as you'll see, what some of the, the generals um, and soldiers of the Union were saying, you know, the regiment has returned and Randolph is gone. And you'll find that in a lot of things where they're, they're happily reporting on how um, towns, are, they've completely destroyed them, nothing left. Um, so, as you'll see, he actually ordered General Dix on one occasion to silence the press to arrest and imprison um, newspaper reporters because they had unfortunately written something in the newspaper that um, wasn't accurate. Um, so unlike today, you know, where you just you know print a retraction, he wanted them imprisoned so they couldn't do it again, and uh, no more fake news, I guess, would come out. Um, we will move quickly on. Um, I guess we'll need to go past because I can see she's here. So we'll, we'll, we'll go quickly on. So we'll have to go past a lot of this stuff. I'm so but um, this is the big one, obviously, people want to know about this. Um, so this was actually a cartoon at the time. Basically, it says, one good turn deserves another. So it's basically, you know, well, I've, I've set you free. You know, you know uh, come pick up a gun. So there's five different points on it. The first one is the Corman Amendment. Um, now this was, as you'll see, this was written by Abraham Lincoln two days before he was inaugurated. And in it, this is just one of the letters he sent to, this was to the governor of North Carolina. Um, so in that, he's basically saying that he's transmitting an authenticated copy. It was a resolution to amend the Constitution of the United States. Um, and this was approved on the 2nd of March. Uh, 1861. So he's putting his name to it, asking people to sign it. Um, so what is this proposed amendment? If it had passed, if it had been ratified by all the states, it would have been known as the 13th Amendment. Um, so as you know, just now, the 13th Amendment was the one that actually freed slaves. But this 13th Amendment would have taken away all power of the government and left the rights to any states to decide whether they would want to remove slavery or not. He was quite willingly saying, yep, this is what we need to do. We need to get the southern states to come back in, so we're going to agree to this, that they can choose when they want to remove slavery. Um, and even in his, um, if it comes up, in his inaugural address, he even mentions it about the proposed amendment. Uh, and he says, I have no objections to it being made express and irrevocable. So in his inauguration, he was more than happy to, to let anyone else decide about slavery. Um, and of course, you would think that it would have gone by now, the Corwin Amendment, um, but as you can see, it's actually still there. Um, there was, I believe, seven states have ratified the amendment. Uh, and if all the states do want to ratify it, it could st still technically go through just as another amendment. Um, just as a side bit, Texas actually tried to ratify it in 1961, um, but they failed, strangely enough. But, but this also leads to another point of, this would have been one of the strongest times for the southern states to come back into the Union. If, if, if it was only about slavery, 
I would have been saying that they're now giving you guarantees that it's up to you when you want to do it. The southern states did not return. So to me it gives us an indication there was more than just the issue of that at hand. Um, now, the Emancipation Proclamation. This is, the, to me, it's a big one. Um, the main points, they basically say that, you know, if you're held within any state you know, that's in rebellion against the United States, you'll be free. But any state that become qualified to be able to return back into the Union would no longer be in rebellion. He also quotes, it's a fit and necessary war measure um, to suppress the rebellion. And in this, you'll see a whole list. Now, everything here you will see, when it comes to Louisiana, there are like 13 different parishes that are exempted by the Emancipation Proclamation. So what that means is all these states, Arkansas, um, Texas, Louisiana, well, although it says the exceptions of Louisiana, 13 states, um, what that means is that if you were a slave in New Orleans at the time, because we have also in St. Bernard Parish is there as well, um, so if you were a slave here, under Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, you were still a slave. Even though the Union had the ability to let you go, the, it did not cover that. It was only rebellious states, so as such, it would be seen as a war measure, basically to try and have an uprising, trying to increase the number of troops that you had. Um, to, to basically come into the Union. Um, so, views on equality of the races. Um, I'll only be a few more minutes. Um, so, as you see, back in 1854, Lincoln saying, you know, free them, make them politically and socially are equals. My own feelings will not admit of this. Um, in his first Republican state convention, it's known as the Lost Speech, 1856, said it was government made by white men, they were and are the superior race. Um, nor is there any argument, we are superior. Uh, he is, you know, Negro has one talent, well, we have ten. He also says, uh, you know, as, so basically, as you can see, he's, he doesn't really think much of the, of the African-American population at that point in time. Um, on emancipation, he actually stated, as well, in 1856, that the Fugitive Slave Law was passed in 1793. It was, however, a wise law, a just one. So he seemed all for that. Um, and on several occasions, including his inaugural address, he says, I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery. Um, so to me, that's quite important, because his inaugural address is, it deals more with how the revenue is going to be brought in as opposed to the issue of slavery. And when he does comment on it, it's basically, I have no inclination to do anything about it. Um, it's not something I, I'm going to do. And even when Union generals try to have emancipation, um, he even states it there that it's political and it's, it's only if it's militarily necessary. Um, and it also mentioned about the black codes, and you may not know about this, but um, the northern states had black codes long before the southern states. In fact, um, you'll see um, one of the best ones, because um, we've got an Indiana native here. Yeah. That's for Linda down there. She's paying no attention now. Um, it's she, that's it. So Indiana, you'll see um, Article 13, it's no Negro or mulatto shall come into or settle in the state. So basically, hey, you couldn't come into the state even if you wanted to. Um, they wanted to keep it a certain way. And it shows in, in Illinois as well. Um, uh, so what else do we have? The, what is views on freed slaves and, and free people of color? So basically the way Lincoln felt as if, if you're reading, if you're reading that, that um, well, they may have been looking to free them, he certainly didn't want them in the States. He was looking at options of colonization back to Li Liberia in Africa, um, Haiti, the Caribbean, all these, all these other colonies, other areas, but not the US. Um, so make of it what you will in terms of what, you know, what you feel he was thinking about it, but um, 
I mean, they, they even says um, that they'd be looking to basically raise funds to actually, you know, send them overseas. Um, and on the eve of the Emancipation Proclamation, what he actually did, this was an actual agreement, a contract, where they paid a ship captain $50 a head for 500 um, freed slaves to send to Haiti. Uh, so, remember, one day before the Emancipation Proclamation, he's sending 500 people south to Haiti, um, and not too many survived. But another point, um, the, the, they did attempt to have some peace talks even as late as February 1865, so you'll see that Lincoln offered this you know, fantastic peace deal of um, you, ex you know, accept the Confederacy as being part of the Union. So basically saying to Jefferson Davis in the South, well, here's for peace. One, you have to come back to us. Two, anybody that's fought for the Confederacy will be classed as repentant criminals. So you have a criminal record. And three, he actually says that he would allow all the states to vote on whether to keep or remove slavery. So even two months before he died, he was still pretty much using slavery as a bargaining chip. He, it wasn't set in stone, unfortunately. Um, so, almost finished, and I thought I'd put a little comparison. Um, so... Abraham Lincoln and Robert E. Lee thought it was kind of appropriate. Um, somebody has a monument, another one doesn't anymore. Um, <sighs> so um, Abraham Lincoln and Robert E. Lee were the first secession. Neither one of them were. Lee stated quite clearly he was not. For, he didn't want his state to secede. Did either of them actually own slaves? No. Nope. Um, did they marry into slave-owning families? Yep. Well, Lincoln married uh, Mary Todd. Um, her father had quite a few slaves. Lee married, uh, married uh, uh, Custis, um, you know, and, and the Custis family. Um, he, had, he had slaves. Now, the emancipation of slaves on the father-in-law's death. So when Lincoln's father-in-law died, the slaves that he had were not given out into, you know, they were not emancipated. They were actually remained within the family as property. And it even goes showing you down the different um, you, um, censuses how the, the slaves uh, changed uh, in, in over like a 30-year period. So you could tell that the, the Todd family were still buying and selling slaves. They were even having some birth in slavery on you know on some of the premises. So, so Mary Todd's Mary Todd Lincoln's family were still 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 had slaves a good bit. And Robert E. Lee, well he was only the executor of the will of G. W. Custis and basically it did say that he had to free them within five years. Um, and he did. Um, thoughts on freed slaves? Well Lincoln said it you know, basically root hog or die, and by that he meant he was being asked at the time, what should we do if, if these slaves become free? How do we look after them? And he basically was the opinion of, well, once they're free, they've just got to root, root things out, hog. If they don't, then they die. That's just, that's just how it is. Um, obviously, we know that Lee said that about slavery as an institution, moral and political evil. Um, and... And he also said, upon seeing the will and being executor, he said, your grandfather has left me an unpleasant legacy. Um, and that was obviously uh, to his son that he was speaking that on. Um, now, people's observation on the two of them, a General Wadsworth had actually said, the president is not with us, he has no anti-slavery instincts. And uh, John B. Jones, writing about Lee, um, talking about Mr. Lyons, said that he thinks Lee was always a thorough emancipationist. He owns no slaves. Did he influence the mind of his father-in-law? Which maybe he did because his father-in-law wanted the slaves freed. And just one final point, military record. Well, Lincoln was a volunteer in the Illinois mil militia um, for 81 days. And for that, he received a land grant for serving those 81 days. And Lee, 
Well, he was in the Union Army from 1825 to 1861, served in the Mexican War, was the superintendent of West Point, um, also um, put an end to the Harper's, Raid, Harper's Ferry Raid um, with John Brown, and offered the, the command of the Union Army in 1861. He turned it down after three days of thinking, and then ultimately um, he resigned his co commission afterwards and returned back to com to, to Virginia to ultimately lead the uh, the Confederate court, uh, Army. So hopefully, I would think that we've re-examined and maybe there's been some things that you uh, didn't know about, some things you did maybe. Um, so my apologies for running so long, but thank you for still being here and being awake. <laughs>